Today's National Midwifery Free Conference is a significant and a special occasion for the ministry and more so for the midwives and the aspiring midwives here today. The theme, improving midwifery competencies in achieving universal health coverage, aligns perfectly with the Ministry of Health and by extension, the government of St. Lucia's strategic direction towards universal health coverage. Midwives play a crucial role in achieving universal health coverage. They not just provide maternal health care, but care across the lifespan. It is with great pleasure that I now invite the Chief Nursing Officer, the Kofni Shalmain Suraj, to deliver the welcome remarks. Welcome, Ms. Suraj. It is my distinct privilege and honor to welcome every single one of you here today to this second National Midwifery Conference for St. Lucia. The theme of this conference is improving midwifery competencies in achieving UHC. We are pleased, and when I say we, the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs, is pleased to welcome all of you midwives, pupil midwives, and also aspiring midwives to this function. This conference is not only for professional development, but also today we will be going through a series of activities, so it will also be a fact-finding conference. You will be guided through the use of QR codes that will inform a training plan and also a quality improvement plan that will be implemented throughout the next nine months. So therefore, I welcome you. I welcome our minister. Thank you, minister, for coming. I welcome our CMO, our DPS, our UHC director, and most of all, I welcome our facilitator for this conference, Dr. Hartman. Again, welcome all of you, and I wish you a very productive day. Thank you very much. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted the health systems of even the most developed economies of the world in an unprecedented manner. The situation is also very challenging for less developed countries with existing inequalities in their healthcare system, amplifying the need to accelerate efforts to build strong and resilient healthcare systems to achieve progress towards universal health coverage, or UHC. Providing quality health services where and when persons need it without the risk of financial hardship is the key component of universal health coverage. Midwives are often the first point of contact for pregnant women and strategically placed to provide care to women and their newborns across the childbirth continuum, autonom autonomously collaborating as needed with other healthcare professionals. Data shows that investing in midwives can improve health outcomes for women and newborns, facilitate economic stability, and have a positive macroeconomic impact. Ensuring universal midwife coverage by 2035 could avert 67% of maternal deaths, 64% of newborn deaths, and 65% of stillbirths. Midwives are at the forefront of ensuring women and families have access to quality care and are very critical in times of crisis where adverse climatic conditions, social unrest, and poor or lack of transportation exist. Midwives should be regularly admitted to midwifery educational programs to professionally meet national and international standards. Doing this, they could avert 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal deaths. Achieving this impact also requires that midwives are licensed and regulated, fully integrated into health systems, and working in interprofessional teams. Beyond maternal and newborn deaths, quality midwifery can improve other health-related outcomes, and that would include sexual and reproductive health, immunization, 
breastfeeding, tobacco cessation in pregnancy, early childhood development, and postpartum depression. Educating midwives to international standards is a cost-effective investment as it saves resources by reducing cost and unnecessary interventions. Midwife education, or midwifery education rather, is a key solution to the challenge of providing universal and quality maternal and newborn care to meet our sustainable development goals. While improving access to care is critical, ensuring good quality care has an even greater impact in terms of lives saved. All midwives should be educated to high standards and enabled to practice to their full scope. The education policy should also be aligned to meet the needs and expenditures. Midwives also provide a variety of services including family planning, preception, preconception care, prenatal exams and tests, physical and psychological health monitoring, birth planning or what we call baby spacing advice, education and counseling, emotional and practical support during labor, hospital admission, delivery of babies and discharge. They continue to monitor mothers and babies even after discharge to the primary healthcare setting. The goal of midwifery is to offer care that respects the goals and choices of each individual woman and her family. A midwife will help a woman make decisions regarding how to cope with labor and to explain pain relief options. Improving midwifery competencies would redound to an enhancement in the reproductive education in fertility, nutrition exercises, contraception, pregnancy, health, healthy breastfeeding, and quality infant care. Midwives are also expected to be understanding, caring, emotional, and mentally strong, a good observer and a listener to patients. They must have the ability to get along well with persons of diverse backgrounds, which is critical for patient satisfaction and of course, a harmonious working relationship. Universal health coverage has become increasingly a salient issue for developed and developing countries alike in the context of an economic um, crisis. There is an increased recognition that providing quality a quality um, universal health coverage is an investment, an investment for the long-term future. Health systems should have an increased access to health information, to medicines, to vaccines, to improved prevention initiatives, improved diagnosis and treatment, thus the overall improvement of patients' quality of life. Patient-centered approach will reduce health inequalities and guarantee long-term sustainability and flexibility. So the Ministry of Health in St. Lucia by no means have been left in the dark on the importance of improving midwifery competencies in attaining, attaining universal health coverage. The first service launched under UHC was maternal and child health service. And this clearly demonstrates the level of importance that the Ministry of Health holds for midwives. Midwives were trained in the management of maternal and neonatal complications, the mass session training, and customer satisfaction training. And all of this was done as a means to improve these services at the primary healthcare facilities, as well as the hospitals and the private sector. The expectant mothers have definitely benefited from the additional laboratory and ultrasound services that is offered through the wellness center under phase one of maternal and child health services of, for under UHC. Between June 2023 to March 2024, UHC has provided more than 1,719 ultrasounds for pregnant women. From June 2023, to March of 2024, the UHC initiative provided routine laboratories for 1,375 pregnant women. Though our birth rate has been on the decline over the past few years, we still intend to do more for our expectant mothers in St. Lucia, and UHC will allow us to do so. In closing, we understand that universal health coverage should not be achieved without maternal and child care. 
prioritizing women and children's health with access to quality healthcare services by pregnant and lactating women without any financial hardship is crucial. We know it requires leadership. It requires commitment, investment in our midwives. Having such a conference today with 102 nurses being registered clearly demonstrates the Ministry of Health leadership, commitment, and investment in midwifery. So the Ministry of Health is aware that to meet the sustainable development goals, it must accelerate progress and holster maternal and child health under universal health coverage. This we can only do by improving midwifery competencies. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eugene. We know that Dr. Eugene is very passionate about universal health coverage, and I'm sure you could hear it in the delivery of her remarks. So Dr. Eugene, of course, she highlighted the importance of midwives, their role in achieving universal health coverage. She spoke of improve, um, all of that towards improved health outcomes, and of course, building resilient health systems. She emphasized the importance of improving competencies, stressing a lot on midwifery education. All of this towards ensuring high quality of care. Thanks again, Dr. Eugene. It is now my pleasure to welcome the Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Mr. Ernest Noval, to deliver remarks to the gathering. Welcome, DPS. On behalf of the Ministry of Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs, welcome all of you to the National Midwifery Conference 2004. This is the second midwifery conference in the history of the Ministry of Health, the first being in 2013. Initially, the ministry planned for 75 participants. However, due to the overwhelming responses and interest, registration was capped at 102 participants. St. Lucia has 145 active midwives registered, and 89 of you are here today. This shows commitment and dedication to the profession, and your interest and own professional growth, and this is commendable. The Ministry is pleased to welcome Dr. Pandora Hartman, Chief Nursing Officer of Japaigo, as facilitator for this conference, who comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience to impart on our midwives here today. It is known that midwives provide 87% of sexual reproduction and maternal health services within primary and secondary care. Therefore, providing of an, an enabling environment above allows midwives to offer full scope of services must be provided to efficiently achieve universal health coverage, UHC. UHC is a target in the Sustainable Development Goal 3, ensure health lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. This target, 3.8, achieves universal health coverage, includes financial risk protection, and to access high quality health services, medicines, and vaccines. Despite significant gains in the SDGs, 830 women and 7,000 newborns still die every day due to complications in pregnancy and childbirth around the world. Maternal and newborn care remains a priority area for the Ministry of Health. Approximately 92% of pregnant women across public or private health care and at, at least three times during the, pre the access primary health care at least three times during their pregnancy and after delivery. In order to increase access in, in care and increase provision of essential maternal and child services, capacity building for midwives 
need to be deliberate and intensified as we recognize that strengthening and expanding skill sets of midwives will most definitely improve maternal and child health outcomes. So this conference is timely and well pleased as UHC is one of the priority areas for the ministry. As the ministry continues to strengthen maternal and child health services on the island, we recognize that the success of this program lies heavily on having competent, skilled nurses and midwives for care of pregnant women and newborns. Therefore, I bid you a very productive day, a relaxing one. Know that your efforts are recognized and appreciated and the ministry thanks you for your service. Do have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Mr. Nobal, our Deputy Permanent Secretary, for your remarks and the commitment of the ministry in supporting midwifery care at St. Lucia. Our next speaker is our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmar George. Help me welcome Dr. Belmar to address you. I also want to join the Chief Nursing Officer, Nurse Suraj, in welcoming all of you today to this conference. For me, um, although it's supposed to have been a day off, there is no way I could have not come to this conference, which I see as extremely important, not only for the educational um, intervention that's happening today, but it also gives me an opportunity to meet and see so many of you that on my return to country, I got the opportunity to learn firsthand from you at the Victoria Hospital. So that was my first contact with a lot of you here today. I learned so much from you when I started at the Victoria Hospital. I also got the opportunity to work with alongside you on the wards at the majority of our health facilities in St. Lucia. And when I had an experience, I could never forget, a lot of you cared for me during the birth and the time during the delivery of my twins, and even the care for my twins while at the Victoria Hospital. So the opportunity to see a lot of you that I don't see anymore, I could not, um, not come here this morning. I think in terms of midwives, I'm just going to very briefly go through the crucial role that you play within our healthcare system. And we know that the nurses form the backbone of our healthcare um, system. But in particular, when it comes to maternal child health, the invaluable contribution that you place, which is essential for safe and healthy pregnancies, childbirth, and postpartum care. We look at the role of midwives as the primary caregivers during pregnancy, labor, and delivery, the personalized care and support and guidance throughout the entire process. And I can tell you, I witnessed um, this, the, the outcome I had when everybody thought that probably both me and my twins would not make it. If it was not for a lot of you in this room, um, we would not be here today. So firsthand, I know the, the level of care that exists here on island. I also want to indicate that for our setting, where in a lot of our small communities, a lot of our women cannot afford private care, which some people think it's better, but it's really not. The, the importance that you care with you place within the community in both underserved and probably rural areas where access to direct care may not be as, as available the role that you play there, ensuring that the necessary care and support is given in reducing maternal and infant mortality rates, which in some parts of the world remains um, high. And the contribution that you place in the well-being of women beyond childbirth, this holistic approach that ensures that women receive continuous care throughout their reproductive lives, which, which, which leads to improved health outcomes and a higher quality 
of life. Now, I think it's very important that we look at our local context when we look at the role of midwives. We are seeing reduced numbers of babies being born. We are also noting the risk factors towards poor maternal outcomes. When our data from our step survey, we see women, a lot of the toxic habits which were associated with men, we see younger women smoke, younger women drink, and we also note a reduction in our birth rates. It is even more critical in our context that the quality of conception be as high as possible because we're already getting less. So it's extremely important that from very early within maternal health, we ensure that our babies that are born are very healthy. And when I spoke of the importance of midwives to holistic health, I was very um, happy to see, and I have to recognize our chief nursing officer for ensuring that this conference happened. I know the midwifery day was in May, and the conference was initially for May, but she has insisted that this conference come through to ensure you get the level of recognition that you, you deserve. One of the things which particularly struck me was one of the items on the agenda, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Mental health is one of the areas that we tend not to put a lot of focus on. So I was very pleased to see that apart from all of the core competencies that are being done today, the, the mental health aspect associated with pregnancy was also um, included on the agenda. So I want to wrap up because I know you have a full day ahead. I once again welcome you and it is, I was so happy to see a lot of people I've not seen in a long time and I really wish you a very good and productive conference. Thank you. Our next item is our feature presentation by Dr. Pandora Hartman. Please allow me to introduce Dr. Hartman. Dr. Pandora Hartman, a native born and raised Bermudian, brings over three decades of experience in the USA, Caribbean, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. She has served in a variety of roles from chief nursing officer and midwifery officer to home birth practitioner to fertility expert to adjunct professor at large high volume clinical sites. After graduating from John Hopkins University, the University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the United States. A former ICM board member representing the Americas, she is also a fellow of both the American College of Nurse Midwives and the American Academy of Nursing, Services, of Nursing, serving on several expert panels and as midwife liaison to the American Academy of Pediatrics. She has worked closely with ministries of health, multilateral organizations, and nursing and midwifery organizations to provide strategic directions clinical and programmatic assistance for global, regional, and country-level programs. Her expertise spans regulatory process, curriculum development, leadership, and workforce capi capacitation in the humanitarian of development nexus. She continues to devote a portion of her time to catching babies a socio-economically and culturally diverse practice in metropolitan areas. She is known for encouraging midwives to push for change past the perineum, both within and outside of the system. Help me welcome Dr. Hartman to deliver her presentation. Distinguished colleagues, thank you again for your welcome. All protocol established and observed. I am delighted to be here 
with dignitaries, our honorable minister, our honorable permanent secretary, and all of you as nurses and midwives of St. Lucia. It's my honor to speak to you today. I stand here before you and bring greetings as a daughter of the Caribbean diaspora, born of the Devil's Isle, raised, representing not just the brain drain, but the brain gain that can also be accomplished to contribute to our global field of nursing and midwifery. It is possible. I never like to speak at any gathering without remembering those who have gone before us, those who have paved a path for this noble profession. Our Caribbean region in particular has been blessed by a range of nurse midwife leaders who rose from small island nations, even in the colonial eras, to make an impact on nursing and midwifery. We call their names, our early leaders in this gathering today in remembrance for past, present, and future. Mary C. Cole, contemporary of Florence Nightingale, but forgotten. Cuba Cornwallis, arguably one of our first nurse practitioners who advanced practice despite being ostracized. The doctresses and nanas, as they were called of our region, who professionalized and became forces for good. Nursing and midwifery as fields that are distinct but strongly connected. Strongly related ancestors sharing historical challenges and contemporary connection. Staff shortages, migration, service schemes, codes of practice that have not caught up with what we can do public misconception. From the drunken dregs of society, indulging in malpractices, AKA Oliver Twist, to the darlings battling on the COVID front lines to keep healthcare systems going. No picture of us as midwives is completely correct. Well, because we know that midwifery is indeed one of the professions throughout history, the past and present, that has sought to make the world a better place. A profession that has gotten even more complex with the combined and intertwined comorbidities of health, non-communicable diseases, changing family structures, and socio-demographic profiles that are shifting with a planet that can no longer support us. History defines us, yet much of our tale here in the Caribbean region has been lost to time. Lost to our numbers that are no longer entering the profession. Numbers not reflective of current needs or the needs and families placed in our care. One global truth is that we are in the middle of unprecedented times, right midwives and nurses? The fact that was illustrated by the series of State of the World's Midwifery Reports. The 2021 version led by the UNFPA, WHO, and the International Confederation of Midwives, ICAM. I have been proud to be a part of all three of the SOMI reports, starting with my doctoral work in 2011, 2014, and 2021, and finally now our Caribbean report that finally reflects us who were uncounted small nations. That SOMI analysis said for the 2021 that there was a global unmet need of almost a million of us. Can you imagine? And that was even before the COVID pandemic started. The need is dire as a jumbo jet estimated full of women dies every day. But we're not counting the 30 jumbo jets of women that are impacted forever by intimate partner violence, gender-based violence, birth trauma, cardiac problems. Well, one thing is certain, we need to revitalize midwifery, don't we? We are bought here today, each of you as a part of that revitalization process, bringing the art and science of midwifery together. A part of the revitalization for the CARICOM region, 
a vision that is integrated, inclusive, resilient, driven by knowledge and excellence. Our Caribbean community where all of us as citizens are secure. We know that rebirth and renewal is possible with your collective efforts. St. Lucia, who has moved rapidly to the forefront of the CARICOM countries advancing. When we think about midwifery, my mind turns to these hallmarks of midwifery practice from a 1993 poem by Nancy Fleming that first really set into art and science some of what of our hallmarks. Just take a look at this. Family-centered care, shared decision-making, meeting the needs of vulnerable populations, support to normal physiologic processes, to name a few. None of us in this room would disagree that these hallmarks serve as our guideposts, and if they don't, they will after today, <laughs> our guideposts for midwifery practice. But you know, what does any of this really mean as we reflect on our time here together, as we contemplate the rich interplay of factors needed to mainstream midwifery as a foundational core of maternal newborn reproductive health here in St. Lucia? And indeed, what is it that we need to radically revitalize? The sad reality is that our workforce is not catching up. And some saying that with our current brain drain, we're never going to catch up. So what we need is a radical reimagination of midwifery. Radical reimagination. My use of that word radical may have been a cause of concern for some of you. I'm not saying we need to go and burn down the parliament. But what I am saying is that I've heard from many midwife leaders that I can't do this, I can't change. What about my job? I don't want to be seen as unruly. I might upset dot, dot, dot. Sounds familiar? Mm-hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am here to tell you that the spirit of rebellion is central to midwifery. It's as central as birth in a squatting position which I hope everyone is doing. <laughs> hmm. Well, who amongst you knows the story of these ladies? Puha and Shepra, Egyptian midwives. Who knows the story of Moses? How about we forgot the midwives who were behind Moses? Think about this. The Pharaoh said, put those babies to death. This is an interesting story because it actually, in my travels around the world, I found it crosses every religious doctrine. What does that say about myths and tales? Just think about this story of defiance. Those women had to be pretty crafty and rebellious, didn't they? Mm -hmm. According to Exodus 1.17, they said, because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. When the king questioned the midwives about the birth rates, they told him the Hebrew women aren't like us. They just deliver too fast. They're vigorous. They get their babies quickly before we get there. Have you ever thought about the fact that they risked their own lives? They risked their lives to save the women and the babies. And here in St. Lucia, that spirit of rebellion and heritage is what we all need to reclaim, not just in St. Lucia, but in our region, to really rebirth the change from midwifery. Because clearly what we're doing hasn't caught up, has it? It's not working for the profession, for our women, for the attainment of the sustainable development or UHC goals, or for the economic empowerment that Dr. George has mentioned. We know. Well, what I can tell you is that the high-level reports are all pretty much copy and paste. Even if you go back as far as the Moy Commission that was sent here to look at what was happening in our region, nothing has really changed. I could almost copy and paste from 1840 looking at that report. 
there have been shifts, but they're really too small and incremental to really stop those jumbo jets from crashing. While we're here, I want you to think about St. Lucia's role in the midwifery rebellion that we're steering. Think about a few factoids for St. Lucia. The first to be named after a female patron saint. Did you know one of two countries in the world still? Hmm. Fun fact, St. Lucia as an anagram is lunatic. <laughs> Bring it on. Just think about the fact that this island nation has changed hands British, French, French, British, British. So do you think there are a few rebels in your history somewhere? Yes. On both sides. Additionally, I would say that when I got here and was stuck in customs, I said, wow, this is actually pretty well timed. You timed this Congress well, despite this. It's on the eve of Carnival. Carnival itself was bred in a spirit of rebellion. In many ways, after the ending of slavery, Carnival then as now served as a form of healing, rebirth, renewal. It was the efforts of our ancestors to be seen and heard and understood using social and political commentary. Midwives, social justice, hmm. Well, do you recognize her? Delicate pink and white lace, accentuating gossamer veils that cascade, a mask. If you don't know her after today, you're gonna look her up a little bit more. She is a doll. She is baby doll, one of our original mask characters. Why? She would roam the streets during carnival accusing male spectators of being her child's father. <laughs> Often when they're ignored, the masquerader refuses to leave, becoming louder and louder and more insistent until the father responds. The chagrin of the accused father is like horrified and the amusement goes on. She moves boldly to the next man, making the same accusations. Hmm. She represents historical layers of impression related to what? Our sexual reproductive health. The rights that midwives, not just the clinical care to get those babies and to treat, these women had no rights often under law. We know that the illegitimate children were produced and we as midwives were there at the bedside, weren't we? Dealing and helping, confronting, well, many believe that some of these original images were a parody of the, of the plight of women and mothers and midwives who often bore the blame when things went wrong for normal SRHR. Well, over 100 years have passed since she emerged and I'm gonna encourage you to go down the Smithsonian Folk Life Trail that looks at some of our traditions in relation to sexual reproductive health. She remains with us in this society, whereas midwives were still haunted by some of those toxic relationships, right? That we are assisting our women through, human rights abuses, women objectified. I think I have given us all our new mascot for midwifery to really think about and re-embrace our history. What I'm gonna ask you all is what are you thinking what are you willing to do to really revitalize midwifery here? What are you really to risk so that we can meet our true potential as midwives? We hear over and over that part of the focus of midwives is what word? Empowerment, have you heard that one too? Empowerment, the narrative says they have to empower midwives, but I needed to understand what empowerment meant, right? In relation to midwifery. Where did it come from? Well, empowerment had roots in psychology from the 1900s and empowering, just the same way Baby Doll empowered herself, we empower ourselves. The action referred to both the process and the professional support. 
To those who felt powerless, lack of influence, and the bringing forward to use all of your resources. Wow. Empowerment was also associated with feminism, which as we know is also associated with midwifery. Movements that have campaigned, when we think about feminist movements, to shift the world. That is how midwifery was reborn, with midwifery as a movement and not a moment. Empowerment, rebellion, a rebellion that is brewing here right now in this room, isn't it? With education, with carnival, with commitment, our spirit lives on. We're going to face the things, aren't we, to revitalize. We're going to face the things and reclaim birth positions, reclaiming it back from the monarchy that put us on our backs. We are going to reclaim our lost wisdom, coming out of our comfort zone to carry the profession forward. It may seem like a lot, I agree, but despite it all, I know that it is possible because you're sitting here. Because hope is invented every day. Hope for a better future, more midwives, more educated midwives, a midwife for every mother. Hope to continue to connect, to share globally. Midwifery is a movement, not just a moment. Midwifery will rise. Midwifery is more than just educating you here today. It's about transformative solidarity. It's about listening more than talking. It's going to be about the real relationships that you're making here to trust and grow. About organizing beyond just interest. About comradeship and community. It's going to be about St. Lucia taking risks together for maternal, newborn, child health. I may not know much. But I do know that this is a collaborative work that you will undertake and that it lies within each of you to change your system. It allows us all together to go on a learning journey to unify and enhance us as caretakers and beings. We can do it. Because today we are here to contemplate who we are now. Who do we want to be? What will the rest of our story as midwives be for this region? How will we address the current problems in midwifery? What are we going to let go to accomplish our vision? What will we do to support all of you and the future midwives to achieve their fullest potential? Before I end, I sincerely want to thank colleagues at the Ministry of Health for investing in midwiferies. Their demonstrated investment in having us all here today to support this gathering. I want to thank all of you as my colleagues for being here and believing in what we could be, even when we don't know what it looks like as midwives. Thank you for your diligence and your hard work, your sleepless night, and the vision of dreamers to bring midwifery forward. We will rebel. We will revitalize midwifery for St. Lucia, won't we? Because we know that in the words of W.E. Dubois, there is, is in this world no such force as the force of a person determined to rise. The human soul cannot and will not be permanently chained. You as midwives will rise and revitalize. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. That's all I could see. Very, very enlightening presentation. All encompassing. Gender based violence, NCDs, mental health, all encompassing. Just a reminder of some of the key terms that we heard throughout the presentation rebirth. Renewal, revitalize, hope, transformative solidarity. And what else did we learn? If <laughs> that the spirit of rebellion is central to Midifi. Yeah? 
and let us leave here at least if there's one thing that we remember from her presentation is that midwifery is a movement hmm? it is a movement yeah so we are now at the point to declare this conference open and to do that is none other than the Minister for Health, Wellness, and Elderly Affairs, Honorable Moses Jabatis. Let us all welcome Minister to deliver his remarks and to make the declaration. Welcome, Minister. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And let me say a very special and warm good morning to Dr. Pandora Hartman, who just delivered. Let's give her another round of applause, please. We from the Caribbean, we, we have a special a vibe, you know? And when she spoke about rebellion and carnival and how she brought these two together, but what really interests me is Rebellion, Carnival, and Midwifery. The three of them, <laughs> I didn't think you could put these three together. <laughs> but thank you very much. I pledge, even before I, I, I say a few words, I pledge the support of the ministry and the government in the reforms that you will be thinking about. So I, I want to tell you to um, have the plans coming in very quickly because we have just started the preparation of next year's budget so please cno and the others cmo and so on put something together so i can take to to the pm let me at this time recognize mr ernest nobal who is very new at this job a few days old our new Deputy Permanent Secretary. And over the last few days, let's give him a round of applause. Where is he? I thought he was right there. Okay. Over the last few days, he's been having several baptisms of fire in the Ministry of Health. So I wish him well. Of course, Dr. Pandora Hartman. Let me also recognize Dr. Sharon Belma George, our Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Glensford Joseph, our Medical Officer of Health, and also Dr. Alicia Eugene Ford, the Director of Universal Health Coverage, who spoke earlier, and all the other officers of the ministry, the various departments. From the St. Jude Hospital, we have Ms. Lydia Atkins, who is the Chief Executive Officer, and other members of the St. Jude team nurses and others. I also want to recognize the teams from, from the Millennium Heights Medical Complex. I don't think Dr. James is here, but I think there are other team members here from Millennium Heights. Not I think there are. Nurse and, and so on. Let me also recognize all the other departments like the PIU and, and others. I don't want to leave out anyone but also invited guests, nurses from all around St. Lucia, a pleasant good morning to you. We have heard before that the World Health Organization defines midwifery in a very special way. Skilled, knowledgeable, compassionate, care for childbearing women, newborn infants, and families across the continuum from pre-pregnancy pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and the early weeks of life. We know that already, and we know the descriptions. This conference today is very timely. I did not expect to see over 100 nurses here today, and I'm very humbled by this, and it demonstrates your interest in professional development, but also your interest in coming together to mobilize among yourselves to ensure that you improve your own profession. This theme, improving midwifery competences in achieving universal health coverage, emphasizes the importance that nurses and midwives play in achieving universal health coverage. 
And if any one of you are unsure about your rule, are unsure about your rule, I'm sure that at the end of this conference, you will be much clearer in relation to your rule within the universal health coverage process. The theme is in keeping with the policy direction of the government of St. Lucia to provide a high quality of health care, to provide high quality of services that is available and accessible to those who require it the most with very little to no out-of-pocket expenses. The Ministry of Health recognizes that universal health coverage is a basic human right, meaning everyone should have access to quality health care. And I want to take five seconds to go over this. Because for me, as the non-medical person, probably the only non-medical person in this room, when I try to explain universal health coverage to medical people, nurses and doctors, many come to me and say, because I'm a politician, okay? So they come to me and say they don't understand what, is, what the government is trying to do with universal health coverage. Some say to me, we've been hearing this thing for 30 years. So what is this thing about universal health coverage and you all are giving free services to pregnant um, women and so on? That does not make sense and we don't understand that. And for those of you who know me, I do not describe myself as anything else but a community mobilizer and a teacher. I was a school teacher for 36 years. I was a school principal for about six years. And so for me, all of my life, two things I think about. When you are in an organization or you are a leader, you need to know how to move things from point A to point B. It's a very simple concept. I don't like to deal with complicated things. So when medical people tell me, what is this universal health thing you, you, you're talking about? I go back to the basics. I tell them what the government is trying to do, some very simple things. Increase access, one. Reduce out-of-pocket costs, two. And increase quality, three. Are we doing, have we been doing these three things? If we have been doing that, well then yes, we have been journeying toward universal health coverage. Has anyone in the past said, this is how we are going to achieve it? Maybe no, and maybe that was not clear. But for us, for our government, and for me, universal health care is very simple. We are going through a phase process of, number one, increasing access. And I'm also a science person. My background is science. And therefore, I like evidence. Where is the evidence which shows and demonstrates that we've been increasing access. Well, Dr. Eugene spoke about the numbers, and I'm sure she didn't even tell you a tenth of some of the things we've been doing. The CMO mentioned a few, and every department, I'm sure, can tell you one, two, three, four things we've been doing to increase access. Sometimes we fight over a lot of them, but at the end of the day, we can demonstrate that we have increased access and we have reduced out-of-pocket costs in the first phase for pregnant women. We said we were going to do it. We launched it in September, in sorry, June of 2023. And today we have the evidence. We can tell you a thousand something women did not pay for the ultrasounds. Evidence. We can tell you a thousand something ladies did not pay for their blood tests. Evidence. We can cost it. We can tell you, if they had to pay for it, they would have had to pay thousands of dollars. Evidence. Are we reducing out-of-pocket costs? The answer is yes. Are we increasing access to ladies who did not see doctors at all in some cases? One lady told a friend of mine, she was crying in Narsus and saying, oh my God, I did not believe that I could get that access. So the evidence is there. So when people tell me, what is this UHC about? I don't understand UHC and politicians have been talking about that for so long. I just laugh. Doctors included. I put them to sit down and I say, doc, I'm not a doctor. I know nothing about injection and these things. But let me show you. Are we increasing access? Yes. Are we increasing quality? Yes. Are we reducing out-of-pocket costs? The answer is yes. And while we are not doing it for everything yet, 
I felt as a minister of government that we could not continue to talk about universal health coverage for the next 10 years without doing anything else. Some people, including doctors and nurses, tell me, but minister, you all can't do UHC if there's no financing. How are you all going to pay for that? Uh, again, I simply sit down and go back to basics. Go back to basics. How are we going to pay for it? We are going to pay for it step by step, phase by phase. We paid for all the maternal services, didn't we? And this year, we are going to pay for increased cervical cancer um, diagnosis, prostate cancer, expanding breast cancer diagnosis. So while we cannot say that we have done all of UHC, we are going step by step, phase by phase, and we are going to achieve it. There are so many countries. When I go to the conferences and you, go to, you listen to Colombia and you listen to Chile and so many of these countries, after 30 years, we are still trying to complete the, the financing model for UHC. They introduced it about 30 years ago. So what I believe is we need to focus on the basic tenets of universal health coverage. If we understand what it is, the very basic tenets, then all of what we are doing here, your midwifery conference, the new skills, all of these things tie into this concept of universal health coverage at the end of the day. Are we increasing quality? Yes. With your new knowledge and your, your upgrading of skills, you are contributing to universal health coverage because you're increasing quality. You'll be increasing access and reducing out-of-pocket costs. Since we started the PBF, for example, by the World Bank, we have a big problem with pharmaceuticals. Why? Because in 2021, July, thereabout, we were serving 2,000, about 2,100, 2,000, 200 individuals with medication for hypertension and diabetes nationally because these medications were free. Not free, I, I hate to say medicines and medical services are free. They no out of pocket costs because they're not free. Right now, my advice from the, from the technical staff is we are serving between 8,000 and 12,000 St. Lucians at the primary care centers with medication. So while some people are debating about whether we're doing UHC or not, the public, the public is, they're accessing the services and we can almost, we can almost it, it's like we can't keep up. And so we have to change all of our procurement, the planning and everything because more and more, thousands more St. Lucians are getting access that they did not have before. So for me, that is the evidence of working towards, step by step, working towards universal health coverage. I thought I should take a few seconds to explain this because at every, every step of the way, the government, we want to ensure that people understand what we are doing. We are not saying we have universal health coverage. We cannot have it one time. But neither are we waiting for 10 years and we just keep talking about UHC. We will make mistakes with the costing, with the way it's done, the training, the access. We will make mistakes. But we are going to make mistakes and build as we go on. And for me, this time I put my political hat on. The more people who get more services, the better. Because that is what we are here for. The financing part, you'll hear about it some other time. We are working on this with the World Bank and with our professionals in the UHC unit and the rest of the ministry. And we are working. And the professionals in the ministry from CMO's office and everybody, we are working together on this. So the whole ministry, while it's challenging, and I can tell you it's challenging, we don't always agree on how this should go and how that should go. We, I know the officers debate for a whole day sometimes, but we are committed to working together and moving the whole ministry together towards the goal of universal health coverage. What I want to say to you is we are very committed to the welfare of nurses and midwives in St. Lucia. It's a priority for us. I know we have challenges. We are working to cushion some of the limitations and the challenges that confront the profession. The most challenging one being, as you know, migration of nurses. 
many of your colleagues and some of you, some of you have gone and you've returned and so on. There are very lucrative offers out of St. Lucia and out of the Caribbean. And not just St. Lucia, but all Caribbean governments are faced with this problem of migration of, of nurses. No one can stop you from migrating. But the government, we are trying our best to put a plan which will entice you to stay or stay a little longer or if you go, come back and you can go again and come back and whatever. We, <laughs> we are thinking about different strategies because we know we cannot tie you down. But we want you still so you will give us some ideas and we are already working on that and you will let us know which is the best way to keep you. I know increase, uh, increasing salaries is the first one, but, but, <laughs> but we, are, we, we will see what happens. We'll see what, what happens. The other, the other very important one has to do with, with the temporary employment of nurses. And we did promise when we were campaigning for this job, this temporary job that we have, we did promise to, to eliminate this practice of temporary appointment of nurses. And, and we are working on it. The thing, as you, I don't have to go into it, you know why? Because of the structure of, of the ministry and the positions that are there, you cannot simply give someone a permanent job just because the ministry wants it. We have to go to the public service and change the whole structure of, the, of community nursing and all of it so that we have more positions that we can have those temporary nurses into. I can guarantee you that we are working on it and hopefully very soon you'll hear an announcement. We are pleased that our ministry invested over $60,000 towards this conference and to continue to build your capacity. I want to also tell you that the ministry continues in its rollout of universal health coverage. There are other investments that are taking place with the infrastructure of health facilities in the country. You know, I'm sure you know, we have almost completed the re refurbishment of the Laotius Wellness Center. Canaries is coming. We've refurbished Deriso. The big one, St. Jude Hospital, work continues at the St. Jude Hospital and very and within a reasonable time, you'll hear some big announcements from the Prime Minister. But we are working on this. You know what we are doing at Victoria Hospital. If you didn't know, the Millennium Heights Medical Complex um, has a wing at the Victoria Hospital that is completely refurbished. And hopefully, we will continue to have more. There are a few patients. Hopefully, we will continue to have even more patients there so we can have an additional 31 beds. As you know, the OKEU has 120 beds compared to the Victoria Hospital, which had at least 150 beds. So you can see our problem right away. Um, the mental wellness center and health centers throughout the country, we are working to improve the infrastructure, improve the environment, provide new equipment. You know also, because you work there, over the last few months, we've been trying to equip many of the health centers with basic, basic equipment urine analyzers and some other basic equipment so that we can get the work done. So as I prepare to, to calm, to be a little calmer, I want to tell you that we know all is not, all is not well. We, it's not 100%. We have some serious problems. Uh, you see it in the news. You hear it from relatives at our accident and emergency departments, both at the St. Jude Hospital and Owen King EU Hospital, and um, we are trying our very best to see how we can assist. In the coming days, there will be some discussions on how we can assist both institutions to, to increase their capacity. We know these are big problems, and therefore, the work in, in the primary care facilities, Grosile Polyclinic, um, how do we expand the facilities there to go 24 hours? How do we expand other well, a few other facilities in different parts of St. Lucia so that we reduce the pressure on the St. Jude Hospital Accident and Emergency and also on the Owen King EU Hospital Accident and Emergency. But the big elephant in the room, what I know you are talking about, but the majority of St. Lucia is not yet talking about, 
is that all of these things are happening because we, we are becoming more and more either careless or unaware that our lifestyles are causing pressure at the hospital. So it is not just the nurses and the doctors that don't care and people come there. When, when the accident and emergency, you have ambulance calls and then people, high blood pressure, stroke and so on. It is not just you. It's not just the nurses. People tell you, oh, these nurses, I seen the time where I'm there and this and that and the doctors and so on, so on, so on, so The way we are going in this country and in the Caribbean, if we don't watch it, no hospital will be big enough to put the people, the pressures that we are seeing with non-communicable diseases. No hospital will be large enough. But we are committed to doing what we must now to cause the situation to be more manageable. So I want to congratulate you and I want to say to you that we are very committed to working with you. The challenges are there, but we are not afraid of the challenges. I'm very committed in the time that I have left to do the best if the Prime Minister um, decides to keep me there for the, for the remaining two years or three, two and a half, not two and a half, two years or one and a half, whatever it is. But in the time that's left, we are very committed to continuing to, to assist you and to give you the assistance that you deserve. So I really want to thank you and congratulate you on this conference. Thank you, Doc, for your, for your inspiring words. And let's not give up because the challenges are difficult. It is out of our struggle, our rebellion. That's why we as a Caribbean civilization, we have achieved so much in in such a short space of time and I know we can do even better. So thank you very much and have a great conference. Thank you.